Brothers of Promotional Prep will be hosting a high-rise seminar May 4th at Passaic County Fire Academy. It'll feature Chief Mike Terpak, Chief Allender Pratt, and Chief Frank Montaigne. Don't be shy. This class is open to anyone. Career, volunteer, firefighter, and officers are all encouraged to take advantage of this amazing opportunity. If your department has high-rise, mid-rise, residential, or commercial, even if it's in your mutual aid areas, you're really doing a disservice to yourself, your people, and your community if you're not preparing for these high-risk incidents. So go over to Promotional Prep at social media or on promotionalprep.com and get registered today. Hey, everybody. How are you? Welcome back. We have another great run here, run number 11 with Lieutenant Jim Heisler from the Evesham Fire Department. Lieutenant James Heisler is, has been a true student of the game, perfecting the craft since 2004. Most of all, he is a proud father of three boys and a loving husband of his incredible wife. Jim is a career lieutenant with the Evesham Fire Rescue, where he has served for 11 years. After being promoted in, two, in 2021, Lieutenant Heisler served as the CO of Station 2, or Station 2 D Platoon and is currently assigned to Station 1, the Main Street Militia, he is, where he has been proudly serving and representing them as their CO since January of this year. Jim is also a proud Army vet and veteran of the Global War on Terror. He is a faithful. He, ha, he faithfully served back-to-back -to -back tours in Syria and Western Iraq, the Triangle of Death. He is still a combat medic, serving in the United States Army Reserve. Beyond be being a self-proclaimed nerd of all things fire and human performance, Jim is a CPSC-credited fire officer and published Firehouse Magazine author. Jim has also recently started Mission First Training, LLC, which aims to provide real-world hands-on training in a variety of buildings slated for demolition. So that all being said, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Jim Heisler. Hey, buddy, what's going on? What's happening, man? Thanks for having me on. You look a little dirty. Do you want some training today? Uh, yeah, I've had the good fortune of spending the last week down at the Cape May uh, Fire Academy, Cape May County Fire Academy, taking my structural collapse specialist with a couple of brothers from work. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. How's that going? Uh, very well. It's being put on by uh, the folks over at Safety and Survival. And I can't say enough good things about those guys. They've been uh, killing it all week. The uh, the amount of things that they forgot, I hope to to learn in my life. So I hear you. I hear you. Fantastic guys over there. All right. So uh, let's get started. Where'd you grow up? Tell us about the early years of young Jimmy. Well, um, if you were around in South Jersey in the early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, you could find me running around the streets of Maple Shade. Uh, born and raised, and uh, came up through the school system there, graduated 2004, um, and kind of started my fire service journey around there. My dad uh, was a longtime volunteer firefighter, still doing it to this day, over 40 years of service. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, he's over in Maple Shade, started his career in Morristown, where he grew up, uh, married my mom. They moved to Maple Shade. He kept the kept the volley train going, and uh, as soon as I was old enough, we didn't have a um, explorer program or anything back then. That wasn't really a thing uh, for us. So as soon as the clock struck midnight on my twenty on my eighteenth birthday, <laughs> my application was in. I was ready to go. So. Nice, nice. I hear you. All right, so that's what brought you to the fire service. Tell us about the early years in the fire service volunteering. Um, the early years were great, man. I mean, it was it was a surreal experience in that the same guys that I grew up with as, you know, like extended family members running around the firehouse, uh, yeah. I was now, you know, shoulder to shoulder with going in uh, to jobs all over the place. We burnt pretty good back in the day uh, in Maple Shade. Got a, a, a good volume of fire duty there. Um, it's where I got my passion for basement fires. We... Had a okay. lot of uh, a lot of fire duty was basement fires for whatever reason at that time period, and um, it just always really intrigued me about 
you know, there's got to be a way, better way to do this. And, you know, just constantly questioning and asking why, not questioning in the sense of undermining anybody, but yeah. just always curious as to, you know, is this the, really the best way we could be doing something like this right now? Uh, well, every but, time we, we came into the fire service about the same time, I went through the fire academy in late 2022 or 2002. Um, sounds like you were right behind me. Every sure. everything, everybody's ever. Oh, anytime you talk about a basement fire, oh, they're they're hot, they're sweaty, they're dangerous, and, and you got to get down there or else you're gonna burned up on the stairs. Yep. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's actually that's actually where we first met was the that's uh, right. ISFSI class, the basement yep. fire class put on by uh, FSRI up in yep. the Rock. That was an awesome class. Phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they, I mean, other than that, the early years were great. I mean, Maple Shade has uh, Route 73 and Route 38 down here in South Jersey. So we had a good amount of cut jobs, things like that. Um, they had these new tools called Homatro tools. So that was pretty okay. cool. I got to play with these hydraulic tools. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that just really, it really puts a lot of, you know, today's stuff in perspective. I, I, I reflect back on it all the time when I think about uh, incidents that we have at work or something like that. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember going on something like this back in back in the day with these old guys and stuff like that. And, you know, it's a fantastic possibility and opportunity to um, to just learn from these guys. Like I said, they they took a special shine to me because you know they they watched me grow up, so it was nice in the regard that you know I can have that guidance and that mentorship even you know even in the firehouse some yeah, of the mentorship I, may have been a little misguided with uh <laughs> hey you should go talk to that girl at the grocery store and here's what you should say to her i'm like oh okay <laughs> yeah yeah once or once or twice that kind of stuff right <laughs> i mean never never um all right so then uh what when uh when did the army come into play was that <clears throat> the army oh man so my my both my grandfathers or am i getting ahead of ourselves no it's all good uh okay what I, listen man i'm this is your show i'm just uh, taking up some airspace for you <laughs> <laughs> but um the army so both of my grandfathers uh were um servicemen they uh they both served in the army um at different capacities different times and um so that that sense of service had always has always been there and i've always wanted to join and everything like that but you know life happens yeah. you know, all these things um fire service wasn't my original pursuit i went to drexel when i graduated high school uh, i was going to pursue a degree in, degree in construction management um but you know i was always volunteering and doing my thing I'm hoping maybe one day i get my call to the big leagues and see if I can uh, you know, keep up with them. But it was always kind of ingrained into me, that sense of duty, especially from those guys. They were very influential in my life. Um, my father being a fireman, my mother being a nurse, like it's just, it was inherent in my family that you were there to, to do for others. Like you were always there to look out for your fellow man and, and take care of one another and all that stuff. In the hierarchy, you were not priority number one, so. Um, and that kind of where that mission, the men and me mantra just really resonated, uh, with me and the rest of my family. So, yeah, absolutely. yeah. So the, the journey was something I always kind of talked about and I had a good friend. Um, his name was Lieutenant Christopher Hunter. He, uh, Cinnamons and firefighter. Uh, when my wife and I moved into Philadelphia, we came back, uh, to Jersey a few years later and uh moved into a little town called riverton i wound up getting on the books as a volunteer with cinnamon's and fire department <clears throat> there's where i met chris and uh the rest of the hunters heroes that they called themselves at the time <laughs> and uh man those guys are fantastic like they cinnamon's and i gotta give them a shout out they have the model of combination fire department they do such a fantastic job of blending the career and volunteer, including everybody from top to bottom. Um, and they never once made me feel like an outsider uh, being a volunteer. And I just, you know, those guys, kudos to them. Um, they're still doing it to this day. Uh, they're making it work. Uh, 
But I go over there, I start talking to, you know, Chris Hunter, and he just keeps telling me, like, listen, man, life is short, bro. Like, you got to do what you got to do, man. Life is short. Life is short. He just kept always saying life is short. <clears throat> Fortunately, a few years later, he passes away um, following a, uh, a run that they went on, and they, they, they deemed it a line of duty death. Um, so we lost Chris, uh, just prior to his birthday. And, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, it was a, it was, that was a tough time. And at that point in my life, my, my mother's grandfather had never, uh, my mother's grand, my mother's father, my grandfather passed away when I was in high school. So, okay. that, you know, that was, I was still very young, didn't really, you know, comprehend a whole lot of the, the emotions. Uh, but Chris was really the first person who was very close to me that I lost. So I, that was that was a tough time. Yeah. And, and the opportunity just kept popping up very serendipitously about the, the military. And I finally said to my wife, I'm like, I can't get out of my head. The fact that Chris just kept saying life is short, life is short. And his life was, in fact, short. Um, yeah. I miss him every day. And, you know, if I was if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have gone on that journey to be quite honest with you. Um, so, you know, uh, I know he's looking out for us and he's watching over us and, you know, making sure we're staying safe and with all the crazy things that we do. But, um, you know, it's, that was kind of with that origin story with the military and said to my wife, I was like, look, if you, if you have my back on this, then I'm, I'm going to do it. And, you know, she's a rock star with this stuff. And, uh, she didn't even bat an eye. She's like, you know, I'm, I'm supporting you. You know, I signed up for this ride and uh, she's been a rock star. So it's awesome. That's she's great. Watching I mean, in the other have... room. She's watching in the other room and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, to have that support at home. I mean, that's really paramount. That's bro, it would, you that's... know, you know, as well as I do, there's Absolutely. nothing that we do today, yesterday, or things we're going to do tomorrow. If it wasn't for having a good basis of support at home. I mean, Absolutely. I'm gone all week at this class, and it's it's tough on her. She's got three little terrorists running around here that I'm I'm pretty sure are trying to string her up by her ankles. But she's take over the fort. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so the she she jumps on board the the army train with me, and um, I went in and talked to the chief. And I was like, hey man, look, at this point I was three or four years on the job in Evesham. I was like, okay. Oh, I got to shit or get off the pot. Like the, the light is tick, the, the light is blinking that time is running out. Um, and at 31 years old, I enlisted in the United States army and went to basic training and was older than most of my drill sergeants. So that was, <laughs> <laughs> but it, that was a good motivator for me because, uh, all the little young bucks, you know, they, uh, kept calling me grandpa, old man, whatever. And I was like, okay, like, whatever you got, man. But then when the PT, <laughs> when the PT scores came out and you see grandpa at the top of the chart for most pushups, fastest run, <laughs> other stuff. I was like, okay, yeah, well, grandpa still got it in him. Try to keep up junior. So, and That's now great. I when I get up in the morning. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That happens. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so is this uh graduation or no that's a that's a pre-deployment ceremony we had uh the unit oh, okay. was, the unit i was with at the time we only had the two kids there dominic and joseph okay uh, had a big uh over on fort dix they had a uh farewell ceremony type situation okay uh, that was right after the formation okay so that's uh so that's over there on doughboy field uh yeah pretty much that was 2000 <laughs> 19 i think that was yeah 2019 all right yep all right so let's get into uh to eve sham okay what uh yeah. just saw an advertisement took shot and or yeah i mean you have some kind of hook in there so i've been on the job there for 11 years if you rewind the clock 11 years ago uh fire jobs were few and far between yes they were they're not falling off the trees like they were today where you could pretty much have your pick of the litter where you want to go, like, which is a yeah. great thing. And that's awesome oh, for, for the young folks out there that are trying to uh, get their foot in the door. Speaking of which, Evesham Fire Rescue is currently hiring. It is. 
you career loot this career guy. EMTs and career fire EMTs. That's right. Shameless plug. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you can get a little banner to constantly scroll across the stream, that'd be great. <laughs> but no, the um yeah, absolutely. Come give us a look, man. It's a, it's a good time. Eve Sham's we'll going get through into a, that a little bit later. Okay, good deal. So um <laughs> Fire jobs were few and far between. I tested everywhere. I tested as far north as Boston, as far south as like the Maryland area, Howard County, all those um, spots down there. And when you do, you're one of 10,000 people taking a test at that point. Mm -hmm. And you know the story. And probably especially around, especially around the time you and I were trying to get on. I tell the young yeah. guys all the time now. I'm yep. like, we had the vets you know mm -hmm. the early round of vets coming back from afghanistan mm -hmm. and then we had the recession in 08 where guys were getting laid off yep and I, it was just it was a tough time and then by that point it was it was tough yep very much so um but like you said no vet status at that point um you know and jersey is many of your uh, as both of your viewers right now with looking at my mug but um they jersey's got civil service and then we got title 40. um eve sham's a title 40 department so it's a chief's test uh they announced their their hiring um criteria of which at the time were were pretty lofty um like college credit requirements fire inspector fire instructor drill ground uh emt fire experience like the whole nine yards <clears throat> and at that point in my career uh, as a volunteer, I was fortunate enough to have amassed enough of the requirements to to throw my hat in the ring. Um, you know, I I interviewed pretty well um, and took the test. It tested very well, and um, I was fortunate enough to get picked up in 2013, class of 2013, with uh, my buddy Rob Gankars up in Jacobstown. Okay, uh, that's my uh, that's my buddy. That's my guy right there, my classmate, and. Um, yeah, it's been a wild ride ever since. Yeah, yeah, man, I remember those days. I, I think mm -hmm. I went as far as far as uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Wow. Uh, and as far west as like Pittsburgh, I think I took a uh, yeah, I think I had a Pittsburgh in there too. And, They're hiring uh, now. I just saw their their uh, advertisement the other day. Yeah, Daryl Jones. Give me but a don't shot. go there. Come to Usham. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Mm. All right. So. Uh, How's uh how's life in Usham treat you? First job? What do you guys you know tell us about the department a little bit? And... Sure, yeah, it's a uh, it's a combination department down here in South Jersey, um, bordered to the north by Mount Laurel. We got Cherry Hill to the west, Voorhees to the south, and uh, Medford, the brothers in Medford over there on our east. Um, it's the southern end of Burlington County, so we border um, a couple of uh, Camden County uh, municipalities. Um, we get along great with everybody around us. I would do a lot of training. This uh, event down in uh, Cape May, there's Mount Laurel guys, Cherry Hill guys, Voorhees guys. It's awesome to be able to train side by side with them. Um, but yeah, it's a combination department. Uh, we've got three stations. Two of them are staffed uh, 24 hours a day. And we got a volunteer station down in Kettle Run. And uh, it's, you know, we have the, the stipend program that uh, is on during the nights, uh, Monday through Friday, well, Saturday through Sunday now, up at uh, Station 1 on Main Street, um, the Main Street Militia. It's where I, uh, I rock out Monday through Friday. I'm on 12s right now. Uh, prior to that, I was on 2472s down at Station 3 and King's Grant, uh, and the D platoon guys. Uh, now, why is it 135 instead of 123? I don't know. <laughs> there's the, I, I, I guarantee there's a reason why. I can't get an answer either. <laughs> I don't know. And that's, uh, that's something I will, I'll do my research and I should know, I should know the answers for that. And I don't, I apologize <laughs> to all the old Eve Sham guys that may, may hear this at one point, but <laughs> <laughs> there might be some Eve Sham people watching right now. Maybe. So we got <laughs> one, station one, three and five for fire. And then station, uh, seven, eight, and nine for, BLS, and they're well. Cool. That's a that's a Burlington County uh, Burlington County thing, right? 
pretty the, much the, the higher numbers being your EMS stations. Yep, that's us. There. I remember that from my days in Bordentown. Okay, there you go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we got um, thirty-seven career firefighters right now. Uh, okay. Just announced the the test. Like you said, we have two full time EMTs, um, which are both rock stars, and uh, I love them very much. And uh, we have a lot of per diem opportunities with us as well as far as EMS goes. Uh, but again, we are hiring for both fire and EMS. So come give us a look. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Now, you guys are part of the Burlington County Hazmat and USAR Task Force, right? Uh, we used to be Hazmat, but um, we gave that up. We deferred that to the county team. Um, okay. some years, some years ago, this was like shortly before I got hired. Um, I was on the County hazmat team for a brief period in the early two thousands when I got my hazmat tech. Um, but then when I came to Evesham, they didn't do that anymore, but we are the hub agency for the Burlington County, um, technical rescue task force. Okay. So you saw our team. Um, we're going through our FEMA typing right now. Um, so, uh, that's where we're at. And that's part of the training that I'm doing now is the structural collapse specialist, uh, which okay. is the FEMA equivalency program. So. Now are your, are the, are the volunteers involved with that as well? Or can they yeah. be? Or? Yeah. Okay. It's open to all the, um, all of our members. Uh, there's a training matrix that our, um, our training folks put together on the, on the tech team um, that kind of highlights the different disciplines we do. We do rope, um, trench, confined space, collapse. Uh, they're doing Landsar now um, and swift water. So, and ice rescue as well. Ooh. So that's that's been fun. Dressing up right. in the gum suits and everything. And yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, you should look into uh, the ice rescue program up in uh, Maine in February. Oh the yeah, program phenomenal. I'm good, <laughs> phenomenal program. I went up and did that a couple of years ago. I'm good. I love the cold, but not that much. <laughs> mm. All right, so uh, guys, you worked with guys, you came on the job with, you know, doing uh, in Evesham. Guys, first fire in Evesham. Any memorable incidents? <sighs> yeah, man. I mean, eleven years went fast. I'll tell you that right now. Um, yeah. I blink and it's, it's in the blink of an eye, but, um, <clears throat> memorable, memorable calls. There was a period of time where we had a lot of fire duty in, in town and, uh, it was fantastic. We were going to a job every couple of weeks. Um, a lot of first due work. I was really for, fortunate to get a lot of first due work. Um, and, uh, our iron seat is the, that's my my favorite seat. I love it so much on the engines. Yeah. Um, cause that is the guy who I tell the, I tell everybody all the time, if the nozzle man comes out and he just kind of wipes his brow, puts his helmet down and he's good to go. He's fine. And the, the irons guy is on all fours gasping for air. That means he, that he did his job. And yeah. I love, I love having the tough jobs on the fire ground. I love it. Um, Rob, uh, Rob, my classmate and I were on a job in Voorhees a couple, uh, I guess it was about this time last year, where we arrived as part of the second alarm companies. <clears throat> we wound up stretching lines, doing searches, pulling ceilings, doing overhaul, top side vent, outside vent, uh, and all of these things. And he's like, bro, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> I was like, no, this is, this is it, bro. We love this stuff, man. We got to get, <laughs> get busy. But got to take advantage while we got it <laughs> exactly but uh no, it's it's always fun working with those guys over there in Voorhees and um and being able to work with with the guys like rob and and uh and kevin who was the chauffeur that day but that no, was it was a lot of fun but um great fantastic training opportunities uh in evesham when i got on they had a guest speaker like what well, it seemed like once a month, but it was every probably five or six months. There was somebody coming in and doing like a nationally recognized conference. And oh, wow. for a young guy like myself, first getting on the job, uh, they're like, Oh, who we got today? Oh, it's uh, chief Fiscuzo from, from Carney. And I'm like, Oh, 
what? Like, that's amazing. And then uh, Jason Bresler from Leadership Under Fire was down doing it. And Mark Van Oppen from Palo Alto is out there. And all these guys are coming in the Evesham. And it was just, I struck gold. I absolutely struck gold with my timing. And like they say, everything happens for a reason. Took all those tests all throughout the Northeast Corridor just to get picked up in Evesham at a time down where. Here. Down yeah. next door. <laughs> yeah. But, um, to just to, to see and hear all these people during like my formative years in the uh, in the career side of the house was was huge. Like it was so impactful to, to sit up there and hear somebody like Mark Von Up and say, "Do your job and treat people right." I was like, it doesn't get much simpler than that. And here we are trying to mind masturbate these these complex systems and and all of these other things. He's like, stop. Do your job, treat people right. Wow, it's amazing. And uh, I, I I never looked back. I mean, I still reference things that Chief Fiscuzo said to this day. Um, yeah. And like all, all of these guys. And it was just amazing to meet the people that I met at that point. Um, and just be in the circles that I was, I was fortunate enough to run in. Uh, you know, Mike Chambers is our training captain now. And man, like... If guys like him and Anthony Bianchi, who I believe you may have met, um, he's retired. He retired off a of deep platoon a couple years ago. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Um, those guys are like two of the most into the job guys I've ever met in my entire life. And they loved training. They loved being fire buffs. And man, we like it was fantastic. The I I just told them all the time, I was like, hey, if you guys ever go out and do something, like I'll be your roadie. Like just let me tag along and, and do whatever it is you guys need to do, whether it was forceful entry training, following them around with the prop and, and doing all that stuff. And that's where I kind of got a love for, for forts and doors. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, just, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for guys like that. And um, if you eventually yeah. see it, thank you very much. Is that, uh, is that this picture? Yes. <laughs> there it is. Uh, man, that was a good time. The three of us went out to, um, what was that, Westchester? That was uh, Chief Aaron Heller's group put on a training okay. at the VA. Um, Berks County. That was Berks County. Okay. Yeah, that was a, a long weekend out there of just doing salty burns. And, and just I was going to say, look at that salty shield on your head, man. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. That's Captain Chambers now. Captain Chambers on the right there, uh, and mm -hmm. Anthony in the middle, and then my goofy ass all the way to the other side. But we were all <laughs> firemen at that point, and like I said, it, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for those fellows. Awesome, awesome. That was a timely picture. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what it was. I, I saw, I, I saw, the, I remembered the picture of three guys, and I'm like, is I don't want to pull up the wrong people. While you... No, that was that was a shot. Do a shot. <laughs> so uh so then so now you you're on the job three years four years whatever it was you leave for the army go through basic now were you always a combat medic or like was that always your uh, your, uh, uh yeah they uh, yeah my mos from jump was was uh medic and it's a funny story actually because I went to MEPS down at uh, the joint base to sign my contract, do the whole physical, all that stuff when I was initially coming in. And the master sergeant that was writing up my contract, he was looking, he's like, oh, medic. He goes, I was a medic way back in the day. He goes, it's a shame you don't have your national registry. And I was like, what's that now? Like, what do you, what do you mean? And he said, oh, if you have your national registry, they knock a huge chunk of your training requirement off and you go home earlier. And I was like, time out. Stop the process right now. What are you talking about? And I was like, I have my Jersey EMT. Does that count? He goes, no, it's got to be National Registry. And I went, is there any way we can press pause on this? Like on this uh, on this contract sign? a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, a few weeks. So my recruiter drove me to the base. And he was waiting out in the parking lot. So I walk out prematurely and I knock on his window. And he's like, what are you doing out here? You're not You're not done yet. I was like, oh, yes, I am. Like, I am done right now. We are leaving. I need to go find how I challenged the National Registry test. 
because it was like six or eight weeks got knocked off of my my training requirement. Yeah, at this point, I am not going to sit married. through an EMT again. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so I, he was driving me back to Cherry Hill where his recruiting office was, and I'm on my phone. I'm looking up uh, a testing site where I can um, challenge the National Registry test. Found one, booked it online, went there the next morning, took and passed the National Registry Registry test by the skin of my teeth. Went back That's the surprising. next day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, went back the next day to the same master sergeant who probably didn't even leave. That's how fast the salt turnaround was. I went, there you go, champ. Like, I don't want to do the entire training. Like, the ink's not even dry. Knock some time <laughs> off. So, <laughs> no, it was good. And uh, they did. And it was, it was fantastic. They called it accelerating um, through medic school. Um, but that was an incredible experience from the start of basic training all the way through coming home was one of the most transformative things I've ever done. And the season of life that I was in at the time had a lot to do with it. Like I had a lot of experience in, with life under my belt at that point. Um, you know, it's ups, downs, the whole nine yards, but it was, uh, you know, it was a good time. And medic school was, was tough, um, but so was being a medic. So it was appropriately tough. And um, graduated, you know, top of my class, honor graduate, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and it was really, it was incredible. Like I tell everybody to this day, being a medic is the best job in the military because you get to immerse yourself in every facet of of uh of military life everybody needs doc so doc yeah. is everywhere and he's nowhere but <laughs> he's everywhere and nowhere <laughs> but uh real quick dl yes, kerr jr says jim you are a class act brother oh that's my guy that's, again uh, i don't i don't know if it's showing up on your screen but there is a chat let me see i don't i don't see it but oh wait there's a comment there Dan you go kerr, that's my guy all but, the chats and comments will show up in there. Yeah, um, Dan is a Dan's a wild man. Um, he uh, recently retired from Pensacola. Okay. Uh, he's helping out as the uh, the interim, the full fledged fire chief. Not sure what the the title title was for Maple Shade. Um, okay. He's helping getting those guys back on track and doing some good things all over the place, even awesome. now in retirement. Never. <laughs> Hard work is never retired. <laughs> mm. That's a testament right there. But yeah, so medic school was um, was a wild time, and uh, got out, came back to work, and that was a sh that was a funny transition coming back into the fire department after just graduating from medic school, uh, because you know you get a difficult airway patient in a BLS and you're like oh I'll just crank them and they're like what yo bro like relax <laughs> I'm like oh Chill right I, I'm allowed to do that here this is not a mannequin <laughs> <laughs> but, but no it was uh that was that was fun the skills man they they transcended the military because you know there's a lot of applicability in this crazy world that we live in with mm. I'm very passionate with the stop the bleed program mm -hmm. um you know, TC3, TECC, teaching the lay person how to do bleeding control. Um, you never know, man. You never know yeah. when you're going to come across an accident on the roadway. It doesn't have to be a hostile event. You could yeah. just roll up on a on a shitty situation. And why wouldn't you want to put yourself in a position where you could do some good? Make Absolutely. It and, and nowadays with this craziness. Yep. It's... Uh, uh, yeah. You're going to come across it. Yeah. So were you always, did you enlist in the reserves right off the bat? National Guard? Actively, like. Yeah, I wanted to go National Guard uh, and be an infantryman um, because I, I just, I love the grunt mentality. I love like just being a down and dirty hands-on guy with stuff. And um, the, that really resonated with me. <clears throat> had a hard time with a lot of their paperwork, like navigating some, some of the, some issues with that. So I was like, this is obviously happening for a reason. 
Uh, I went and talked to a reserve guy and, you know, he's like, oh, well, I wanted to do combat arms. I wanted to do something in a combat MOS. And he's like, well, they don't really have that on the reserve side, but there is combat medic. And I said, ooh, that sounds fun. Let's do that. And then, you know, the rest is history. But best decision I ever made, man, They, uh, awesome. as far as the military goes, was being a medic. I'm currently in a role right now uh, as an instructor candidate going through the pipeline so I can teach other medics how to do medic stuff. Okay. Now, will that be National Registry med EMT instructor? Uh, it, so the way it's going to work is medics who are pro uh, progressing through their NCO career um, have to hit certain benchmarks. So when you go get your staff sergeant, your E6, you have to attend uh, ALC, which it's currently called. Phase three is um, a lot of medical, uh, it's a very heavily, um, it's heavy in the medic stuff where we teach okay. them how to do, we'll teach them how to do advanced airways, chest tubes, um, prolonged field care, like a lot of the more advanced skills um, that medics may have to do out in the field. I'm going to teach up and coming medics how to do that stuff. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Try to is it true that combat medics in your training, they stab a pig and you have to keep a pig alive? It wasn't a pig. It was a goat. But it was a goat. That's it was awesome. a goat. That, that was pre-employment training. That was, that was pretty, that was pretty freaking wild. How long but, do you have to keep them alive for? Um, you have to save them. Um, for any of you uh, PETA folks out there, it was the most humane situation I've ever been a part of. And, I don't uh, think they're watching our show. I don't think so either. I don't think that's your, that's, that might not be your niche market, bro. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't, I'm, I'm. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, it was cool. Cause it was, um, it was a pre-deployment class I had to take where they had the goat lab, they called it. And they put you inside of a tent and, you know, Fluffy's laying there all heavily sedated. And then. I mean, you didn't you, have you to was, give it a name. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> You didn't have to name it. That's true. That um, just makes it mean. I know. But we were friends. I saved his life, so it was okay. But uh, he was destined for the incinerator anyway. But um, they there's a there's a guy standing there. He's like, here's you know all the things that we're taking care of. And then um, he's like, okay, turn around. You turn around. You have your back to the goat. And then stuff happens. You turn back around. And uh, the goat has massive catastrophic in injuries. And he says, go. And you have to try and save this goat's life. And we, we did. And it was a, you're in a team of two and you have to work together. And um, I, would, I was a little hesitant at first for taking this training just based off of what I heard. But I got to tell you that it was fantastic training. Like it was, so, it, it brought such reality to it, to a pre-combat deployment, um, you know, mentality and gave you a real appreciation for holding pressure on an arterial bleed and, you know, all this other stuff. And it always stuck out that the, one of the instructors during one of our like downtime, he, I remember him saying like, oh, the goats have the same anatomy as, um, and they weigh about as much for like basing your weight base calculations for medication and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Because it's, they're very similar to like an 11 year old child. And I was like, ew, like what a morbid thought to think of. Um, fast forward a couple years when I'm in country and I'm treating an 11 year old child with massive, um, with massive injuries, I'm thinking to myself, holy shit, this is just like treating a goat. <laughs> but, and it, it was, and he wasn't wrong. And I was like, oh my God. But, um, we had a successful outcome for the child, so that was good. I, but, but yes, I hopefully was he wasn't destined. He or she wasn't destined for the incinerator. I don't know. I, they ran him back off into the desert, and I never saw him again. So I don't know what happened there. But was is is that around that? That was there. Yes, uh, <laughs> that was in the old uh, the old triangle of death, as they called it. This was a buddy of mine. Uh, we had his reenlistment ceremony. <clears throat> he reenlisted overseas, um, and it just so happens that the ODA guys we were with, uh, with the Special Forces group, um, had to demo 
a, a, a Russian tank. I'm sorry, a tank from a uh, another country. Let's put it that way. And um, it was it was previously damaged in a, pri a prior firefight, uh, and they had to just dispose of it. So we built a little TP of C4 blocks on it, and the demolition sergeant came over and said, "Hey, I'm going to take a picture." So there we go. Allegedly. Yes. All you have to do is say allegedly, and you're good. You're covered. Exactly. <laughs> but no, that uh, was that was fun. Yeah, and that that looks like fun. Mm -hmm. Fun stuff up. I mean, going back to the youth and everything. Yeah, you know, days of the youth. That's right. All right, so you get back. You're back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why, like, 2014, 2015 time frame? Uh, it was 2017 when I came back from medic school. Deployed in 2019, came back in 2020. Um, and I got back in March of 2020. I don't know if you remember what the world was like in March of 2020. You may um, as well have been back over. Bro, what a twilight zone. The people yeah. and places were the same, but everything was different. Like, like, did you come back to, to lockdown? I was the last plane to make it out of the Middle East. The wow. Indiana National Guard, when we all uh, regrouped back in Kuwait, that was kind of that's kind of like the doorway to the Middle East. We all get back into Kuwait. We have to spend a couple of weeks demob in there, and then the plane takes you back stateside, and then you finish your demob there. The Indiana National Guard was right behind us in line, essentially to leave country, leave the theater, and they got quarantined for thirty days. So we were the last folks to make it out of the Middle East. So that was amazing. But like, as soon as we landed in Texas, I got off the plane, and everybody's wearing masks. They're all wearing gowns. Like, there's supposed to be this ceremonial thing where like. The, yeah. the two and three star generals are there to like welcome you home. And they kind of just stood back and fist bumped everybody. Cause they, I'm like, what do you mean you can't shake hands? Like, what do you mean you can't do this? Why is there hand sanitizer everywhere? Like what is going on? And then um, I remember it was March 12th, Thursday, March 12th. I landed back in New Jersey and then Friday the 13th, my son went to school and then never went back for the rest of the year. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the lockdown. It was just, it was bananas, man. Like, it really was. Hey, you know what? From going from, what, a year away from the family, you, you got to catch up very quickly. That is true. <laughs> I was going to lock down whether they wanted me to or not. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was pretty crazy. And then I went back to work yeah. in April. Um, and we hired a bunch of guys. <clears throat> we hired 12 guys. Uh, partly on a safer grant in March of that same year. So I came home, they started at the same time um, and I was able to get back to work just in time for them to start kind of filtering into the firehouse. And I tell them all the time, the guys that are left from that group, I, bro, they were going to look back in 20, 25, 30 years from now and have such like a monumental foundation in the emergency services that you walked in the door during a global pandemic. Like yeah. what a wild ass time. Think whatever you want to think about the politics of it all. Yeah. The fact of the matter is the men and women on the front lines of that, that pandemic did a yeoman's job. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, unreal. And to see these young guys come in the door during that time and it's like oh by the way you have to tie vex suit and we have to tape you up and we're taking your temperature every day and all this other all this other stuff like that's that's wild to think about yeah. when you really put it in perspective and no one could ever take that away from them is what i know not at all what i say i was like the class of 2020 bro like you guys you know that's yeah they joke we joke all the time they're like oh boss you don't ride ems anymore and i'm like yeah you're right and even when I did ride EMS back when I was still a fireman, they are riding a totally different EMS nowadays. The volume is through the roof. The um, the the like the call, the, like the, the the sickness and the acuity of these patients is just unbelievable. And yeah. they're taking it all in stride, and they they just have the ability to hit the ground running. And man, like. 
we are really blessed with the people that they have working there and the high speed individuals that work on work at that fire department to be able to just take these things in stride and and they feel the burnout and me as the company officer i just sit back and i'm like whatever you want me to do like you are the ones that are dictating the pace here by keeping up with all this volume so however i can support you and you need to, you need a break all right i'm gonna switch a couple guys off the engine and um go catch up on charts go get some chow i mean it's 2 30 in the afternoon maybe you should eat something um you know uh, i'm not gonna bother you with menial tasks like because you're getting your your balls kicked in on the ambulance um, and the volume is just going through the roof so I'm really excited to see that we're hiring more because we need to help big time, just like everybody. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and 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 you kind of hit on something that made me think, like that that recruit class of 2020 that we had. You know, these are these are young kids that wanted young kids, you know, you know middle of the range guy that couldn't wait to get that job, like we, like you and I, couldn't wait yep. to get that job, couldn't wait to get that job, and then you come into it in that situation and it's like wait a second like this is i don't want it like this because i'm coming in and i'm gonna be living on the ambulance and in a tyvek suit and with hand sanitizer but this might be my only shot yeah and it shows the it shows their dedication to their their dream you know i'm wanting the i'm wanting it and some of them some of them have moved on to other departments and they're doing great where they are um, but the balance of the guys, like they, they faithfully serve to this day, regardless of that shit storm that they survived, because that's what it is to them. It's a, it's a badge of honor. Like, Hey, like I, we get t-shirts made. I survived the pandemic of 2020. Like, but, um, <laughs> I survived the dumpster fire. <laughs> yeah. Like they, uh, but man, all the, all the kudos in the world to those folks that did that. It's just, I did it for a little bit, but not like they did. Like it's, I, I don't even want to, I feel ashamed just even mentioning it that I did that, but um, they, uh, yeah, no one could ever take that away from them. And it was a galvanizing experience for a lot of them because imagine being a young guy walking in the door. I finally made it. Like you just said, I'm here. I'm in my dream job. And then to see the droves of senior people in the ER in the fire department, in the police department, they're just like, I'm done. I'm spent. Like, this is too much. Like, this is overwhelming. And just retiring yeah. early, leaving the job altogether, going to find something else to do, yeah. going to be a greeter at Home Depot, like, whatever the case may be. Like, they just, they were leaving in droves and like, oh, shit. Like, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my dream job. Why is there, where's everybody going? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you literally coming back from, Two wars, yeah. To what? Wait, what? <laughs> to another one, to a domestic yeah. one. But yeah, yeah, that was a that was a bananas that year. I mean, if you remember, in January that year, all of Australia was on fire. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, Iran was attacking us at that time, right before I was getting ready to come home, which was very inconvenient. Um, <laughs> just all kinds of crazy stuff, but. You know, here we are. We we came out better for it on the other side. Yeah. Supposedly. Definitely. So. So now. Ah uh, yes, there's my beak. What do we got? Ooh, what do we got here? Is this a stair climb or? That was um, at Citizens Bank Park in Philly. The um, American Heart Association had a. Uh, a fundraiser like a, a 5k walk okay uh, and we did this for uh some other brothers and sisters from evesham came out with me and we met up with uh the folks from cinnamon and in the, in the hunter family um to to walk in chris's memory chris hunter that i spoke about earlier okay <clears throat> he died of, of heart disease and as you and many of the others know that's the number one killer of firefighters yeah it's all and a big, big passion of mine to kind of identify this and, and bring it to bring it to light and do something about it. Um, so this is what that was our way of putting our money where our mouth was and getting out there. And we did the walk in, in full PPE and um, folks would 
come up to us and say, why, why are you doing this in gear? And I explained to them, like, this is huge. This is the number one thing that kills firemen. And they were like, wow, yeah. I didn't know. And, you know, it was, it was good in that regard. Um, we met, uh, we met up with, uh, the former commissioner, Adam Teal, of Philly fire. Okay. Fire, and, yeah. yeah. He was, he was so supportive and he's like, Hey, look, I just, I, I saw you guys out of the corner of my eye and I, I chased you down because I wanted to come up and tell you how, how awesome I think this is that you guys are doing this for, for us, like for everybody. Um, and mainly for Chris, but you know, it's, it's for all of us as well. Yeah. Help, help raise like funds. You, said, you educated, you educated how many people that yep. didn't realize that firemen. Like, yeah. So that was, uh, that was good. And, um, we did it for a couple of years in a row and, uh, it was, it was good. We had more and more people came and do it every year. And, um, but yeah, that was, it. that's where that picture, uh, the origin story of that one. Okay. How about that guy? Oh, that guy. Look at that young pup. But, um, that was fun. That was, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be asked um, by a friend of mine named Dave Hernandez, who had that Into the Smoke um, web series. He was hosting a training uh, out at Westchester Fire Academy in PA. And he reached out and said, hey, uh, would you be interested in helping be one of the instructors? And I said, yeah, man, absolutely. And uh, you're never going to guess what my, my subject matter was. It was basement fires. <laughs> nice. Yeah, like so that was fun. Um, me and uh, buddy Don Moorhead from down in Delaware, uh, awesome dude, absolutely awesome fella. He and I did the basement fires and met so many awesome people out there and guys I'm still very close with to this day. Um, a lot of the Maryland guys, it's where I discovered my love for uh, Natty Bo, National Bohemian mm. Beer. Very nice. Hey, yeah, buddy. Um, for those of you who can score at home and you need to know what to get me for Christmas, a case of Natty Bo, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they turned me on. Nice. To that. Oh, you know, I love them for that, but it was, uh, that was good. That was a good time. Great, uh, great experiences. Awesome networking. And I tell the tell people all the time, like you got to get outside the four walls of your, of your, your town, man. Like there's a great big world out there and yep. the amount of knowledge that is outside of your little bubble is just unbelievable. And it really helped develop a lot. Like it was, what a humbling experience to just be some ball bag fireman from Jersey to sit there and say, Hey, we want you to come over and help teach basement fires. I'm like, man, that was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Now, was this after or before your, uh, the UL class? Oh no, this was way before. This was probably, 2016 maybe no okay. 15, 15 16 somewhere in there yeah that was a good time okay. but, yeah. all right all right lots of fun and that was from that same thing oh man look okay at that. those were <laughs> uh all the the guys cut off in that picture we were all the basement fire crew guys doing the stoking and um okay. you know Reset the scenario so we can go out and debrief with the students. Um, oh man, you should have had the uh, the, the aviators on. <laughs> I miss my aviators, bro. But I can't I can't do the good glasses because I just smash them all the time. That's why I got to go on uh, Amazon and buy like the five pack for twenty bucks because I always wind up yeah. smashing them or dropping my helmet <laughs> on them or stepping on them or whatever, leaving them everywhere. I hear you. I hear you. Forget Every my pair of sunglasses. Content. Every pair of sunglasses I have is gouged and scratched and scraped. Yep. Mm. I keep telling myself I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna have this one that's gonna be my work sunglasses. Yeah, no. Nah. Then I lose the other ones. That's these bad boys right here. I have these, they you can't tell, but they are absolutely looks like they're I got in a fight with a, a cheetah with all the scratches <laughs> on them. But uh everybody's like, Oh, like don't forget your nice glasses. I was like, Nice glasses, I got them at a turnpike rest stop. Like, give me a break, man. <laughs> I'd get yelled at because they weren't anti-approved. Yeah, well, that's true. I actually, I forget who I was just talking to the other day. They were talking. They were. Uh, they had a. They were trying to sh 
show the the older heads and get them and the guys on the ground in the same page. So they brought them to the academy to watch truck work being done. And it he said it turned into an hour and a half conversation argument almost coming to blows about whether the one brand of sunglasses was anti approved. I just right. threw his hands up in the air. Was, I, I get... Talk about hijacking <laughs> the conversation, man. That sucks. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, I mean, there's months everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. You just got to deal with them. Mm -hmm. So now, this beast. Oh, yeah. That looks like the war wagon for the Main Street Militia. It's, uh, it's up there with us for sure. That's our, uh, our rescue. The, the, the work group did a great job specking that thing out as far as um, tool complements. There's okay. pretty much nothing that thing can't do, up until include firefighting, because it's got a pump, a tank. It's got a couple of lines on it. Um, okay. So it's that's our first out for any, uh, any wrecks or any reported, okay. um, any kind of wrecks in general, that'll, that'll get dispatched. So we'll cross the floor and jump in that bad boy. It's got a walk in uh walk in body off the um the inside of the cab where okay. we get we have the swift water suits and stuff like that to get guys changed. Um get nice. them up. I like but, that. So yeah. Wish I, like I had a I wish I had a little bit more pickup, but I'm an animal. It's, so. a, it's a big girl. That's she it got is. It. it is. We're nice to her, we take care of her, but you know it's, it's it's to, get to, to get going off the line you a little bit. Yes, right. <laughs> but no, it's good stuff. It's Pierce, bro. What do you oh. want? But. Hey, it, 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 see, I, I can't. I was always a hardcore Pierce guy, but now, like, every manufacturer literally, every manufacturer I feel like you, you need to. This is my spec, mm -hmm. this is what I want, this is how I want it, and yeah, I, I feel like you like the your your truck truck committee or whoever needs to be on top of them. No, I don't want any exceptions. I want what I put on paper. Right. But that being said, you also need your truck committees to know what you need. True. That's very true. And the turnaround time now is just Oh my god. It's light years that you're waiting for these things. Mm -hmm. But you know. Mm-hmm craziness uh, but yeah so we're, what else? We're, we're primary and primarily an engine company out of that firehouse um which i love i mean i miss my my truck work down on the quint but um you know who's to say we whoa, can't whoa, still whoa. you might have you might have just triggered people you That's said okay. the q word i know you said know. the q word and you weren't we hating just, on it <laughs> well i mean it is what it is i don't have a choice but you know we got the quint. thank you it's that's our first um our first foray into the Quint concept in Evesham was this one, 35 we have down in, in King's Grant. Um, it's interesting. It's very, I'll say it's good at everything, but it's not great at anything, if that makes sense. Like it gets the job done. You know, it does what it's got to do. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a truck. You, you're putting... 5.5 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag. That's a, that's a, the predecessor there on the right. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. We sold that one to Cinnaminson actually. Okay. Um, where it's living now doing its thing. <clears throat> Prior to oh, that, we had a grave uh, rear mount straight stick and that was okay. Sally. We loved Sally. We were sad to see Sally go, but yeah. So, uh, but yeah, like you like you said, I don't have a choice. I, this is what they give me, and mm -hmm. I gotta make the best of it. I gotta, I have to, to figure out, especially in the officer seat, you need to figure out how to make it work. Right. Here's your weapon. Here's the number of guys you got. Go to work. Do yeah, the job. I, tell, I uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Jocko Willink. If you've okay. followed Jocko yeah. podcast and stuff like that, um, read all his books, all that other stuff. His big thing is good. Like when you get faced with adversity, just say good and then hunt good in the situation. It's like, oh, well, you want a truck? You want an engine? Well, we're giving you a Quint. 
well, good. Now I can get good at both. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you try to spin it in a positive sense um, to make something, to make something out of it. You know, now I'm up, at, now I'm uptown where I'm riding primarily an engine. Good. Now I can get good at doing engine work, you know, and, and uh, seeing what those guys can do with the, with the pipe. Yeah. Good stuff. Absolutely. So now you want to touch on uh, anything else or can I start asking about mission first? I mean, whatever you want. Taking all no, directions like, from the tower at this point. Anything you want to, uh, anything else at work? You're, any of the guys you want to talk about? Any stories, funny stories? Oh, the Salty Sundays. You were doing Salty oh, Sundays. Yeah, yeah. Salty never, Sundays. Never bro. invited me to one, but you know. I, they cut me off. I got kicked out. Like, <laughs> Now we're gonna have to do like Salty Thursday or something. I don't know, but <laughs> no, Salty Sunday, man, that was that was awesome. That was a lot of fun. That's yeah, rock stars. Yeah, yeah rock stars. And so it it was born. <clears throat> the origin story of that Salty Sunday uh, was kind of like my way of paying homage to those that have come before us, and I had such. A realization when I got made in 2020 as a company officer um, that I, I realized that a lot of my mentors in the department were retiring they were leaving and when they left they were gone like it's your knowledge your experience and all of those things that I was so fortunate to glean as a young firefighter was walking out the door yeah and I just couldn't comprehend the fact that these guys that are walking in the door aren't going to get that. I'm like, man, there's got to be a way to kind of to, to grab onto that before these people are gone forever. But yeah. Um, so I said to, uh, we had a tradition on D platoon um, started by Anthony. Um, he's, he had no conditions uh, for anything uh, as far as writing assignments, anything like that. He goes, my one condition I have is Sunday gravy. Like we're, we're making pasta. We're having a big pot of gravy because it's called gravy. I don't want to hear anything about it. Um, it's made with meat. It's gravy. That's it. Exactly. I, I, I was, I was going to save it, but yes, as long you as you said it, that's it, baby. You got a vowel on the end of your name. You're good to go. So um, I don't. So, but anyway, it's still there. It's in there. I, I promise. You, yeah. You drop the R. It's a silent R. There you go. But, um, <laughs> Anthony said, look, Sunday gravy. That's all I want to do. We, we eat together. We break bread. Um, that was a, one of the core things of Deep Platoon is we just, we spent our time together. Like nobody disappeared in the different corners of the firehouse. Um, we spent our time together. We trained together. We sweat together. Um, we laughed together, cry together, the whole nine yards. Whatever we did, we did it as a group. And that's why I think we were, we were so successful. Um, but on that same in that same vein is Sunday dinners. And I'm like, you know, it would be cool. Like if we start just inviting these old folks back and just sitting with us. It was a young crew with the exception of, of Anthony and myself. Everybody else uh, had single digits as far as year in ser years in service go. Um, and I was like, man, like let's, let's see if this has any traction. Anthony's brother-in-law. Uh, Brian works uh, for FDNY and uh, he's up there in Staten Island and he's a huge Eve Sham buff for some reason. <laughs> it's just, okay. it's, he's always tracked it's, which is ironic because like Anthony and I are huge FDNY buffs. So like <laughs> he would always kind of follow us and stuff like that. If he caught a job, well, <clears throat> if Eve, Eve Sham caught a job, then Brian would text Anthony. He's like, "Oh yeah, go get him, brother!" So, like, <laughs> cracking me up. But super cool dude. Uh, it was right around Anthony's birthday, so I reached out to Brian on the side. I was like, "Yo, like, you want to come surprise Anthony for for Sunday dinner?" And then that's when the wheels started turning. I was like, "Salty Sunday!" I'm like, we should do this all the time. I'm like, yeah, there's there's something here. So then every single Sunday from that Sunday on, it was like almost two straight years. We had a guest. And they were from all walks of life. They were from all over the place. We had um, a UFC fighter, uh, well, former top 10 heavyweight Chris Dawkins. Um, fortunate enough to have met him over in Philly. 
um, through some training, he came out and, and broke bread with us and gave his perspective on training and human performance and stuff like that. <clears throat> and this, this whole concept caught fire, like literally and figuratively, but, um, the guys who weren't on shift started coming back on shift. Guys from other shift would come in when they heard, oh, what, what's Deep Platoon doing for Sunday this week? <laughs> um, who's your guest this week? And what's going on? And it was it was great. And the, I, I come from an Italian family, so a, a big, full kitchen table just it warms my soul, bro. And to see all these guys coming in just to hear what this individual has to say, I'm like, this is it. This is This is what the intent was. And you know, we met that need and it was fantastic. True firehouse fun. mentality. Like, bro, Matt, firehouse Matt, family. Right there in front of you. Yeah. Yep. Guys breaking bread, you know, the generations across the room. Um, my last, <clears throat> well, my last Salty Sunday dinner, we were fortunate that one of the guys on this crew, Kevin, was a legacy fireman in the department. His father, Satch, um, was a retired captain. And Satch didn't really come around anymore. Um, but, uh, when he heard that this was something that was going on, I said to Kevin, I was like, bro, you should ask your dad if he wants to come by for dinner. And he did. And he was like, absolutely. I'd love to. And to have that as like the punctuation mark on the end of the sentence, to have a retired Evesham guy come back who was so instrumental and influential in the way that we do things now, he was a super passionate guy about training um, he was a disciplinarian, but like he had a method to his madness and to hear him just validate a lot of the things that we were doing as a crew and, and just be like, you guys are, this is, this is a good trajectory. You're on the right path here. It was awesome. And that was just like, you know, I can, I can walk away from this platoon now feeling like we, we did make a difference and, um, and it was good stuff. Just prior to Sats joining us, we had the, uh, we called it the Mega Salty Sunday, where every single guest we've ever had, we threw them all an invite and said, yo, come on down to the firehouse. It was, I want to say it was like right before Christmas or just after Christmas or something like that. That no, was right before Christmas because a couple of guys had holiday parties they couldn't, they couldn't miss. <clears throat> so they all came down. We had about uh, probably six or seven past guests come, and you know it was it was awesome. The one guy Joe, that was on the crew, uh, had recently lost his father uh, to cancer the year prior, and um, that Father's Day we worked Father's Day, so I reached out to Joe and I said, "Hey, look, man, um, I want to say this to you first before I pitch it to anybody else. I was thinking about doing inviting all of our dads." For Father's Day and having them as Salty Sunday guests, um, because most of them were all fire service or emergency services somewhere. <clears throat> I was like, but I wanted to kick it to you first because I don't want to be insensitive to the fact that you know you did just lose your mm -hmm. father. Oh, yeah. His father-in-law was the retired chief of Ocean City Fire Department, um, Chief okay. Foglio. Um, so he's like, bro, I really appreciate you re reaching out and, and offering me that. Um, he goes, but I think asking my father-in-law would, would be awesome. I think he'd be on board with it. And he was yeah. he came down, had a great time. And, you know, he's having some, some health problems now, uh, his father-in-law. So, you know, we wish him well and, and hope that he's, uh, has a speedy recovery, <clears throat> but having your dads there was another very, you yeah. know, very galvanizing moment. Like so to see those guys all kind of just chopping it up and you know shooting the shit was it was fantastic and it's like you know you always want to make your father proud you always want to um say like let in and i hope this for my sons too and i know that they're going to have the same mentality because it's unavoidable but it's like you want to show your parents that you're okay like that things are are well and that you're taken care mm -hmm. of and you're provided for and all that good stuff <clears throat> and that your needs are being met and to have them there seeing the good things that we were doing and how we were taking care of one, one another in, in such a dangerous profession, it was it was awesome. Like, it was really cool, and I'm, like, getting goosebumps just thinking about it. And, um, you know, I'm hoping to keep this Sunday thing going uh, in a different capacity. One of our um, 
one of our other retirees had mentioned like flashback Friday or something like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, like that's cool. Like, and they're like, oh, what should we call like salty Sunday or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, listen, man, call whatever you want. I don't give a shit. Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't care. You know, like uh, wear pink tutus and sit at the table. I, I, I don't care as long as the, <laughs> the intent is being met of, yeah. you know, gleaning some of this knowledge before it's gone. And um, man, hearing these war stories from some of these guys, it's I feel like it's the physical manifestation of your podcast because it's all like Jersey guys that come in, sit at the table, you know, you're breaking bread, you're shooting the shit, you're hearing war stories, all this other stuff. And it was it was such a cool experience. And um, when you said you were doing this, I'm like, that's that's awesome. Like this is going to connect Salty Sunday with even more people, whether yeah. you realize it or not. But, um, Absolutely. So no. and, and and that's the that that's the intent. I mean that and to showcase the the quality of of firematic minds and abilities that come out of the great garden state. <laughs> and some of us just sneak into these roles somehow, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hey uh, I, did I, I there's another comment from uh, Brandon Sib Sibson. Oh yeah, Brendo. Fire, fire service needs more people like Jim Heisler, wow. and and I honestly I can't say I can't say I disagree in the slightest. I mean, oh. it's it just it just hearing you talk, you you know anybody listening, anybody watching can see and hear the the amount of passion you have for for the craft and and for your people and for your agency and your department and. And the progression moving forward, um, well, thank it, you. It, you know, that's one of the one of the big things that, that you know, I, I I feel I felt the connection from the word go when we met. I mean, I looked over, I saw the patch. I was like, hey, Eve Sham. Hmm. Yeah. I know that. <laughs> well, thank I know you that place. That. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Brendan, man. I'm, those are the, the those are the kind of guys that just make work worthwhile coming to like. And I had mentioned, it's funny, and if you don't mind, I'm going to go on another tangent here. But No, go ahead. The, Absolutely. It's your show, baby. Not mine. It's your show. So tell me to stop I, it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a narrator. I, I, I just have this screen that I showed you the Snapchat of. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mentioned earlier about the mission, The Men and Me. And that was a book um, about Delta operators. I want to say it was Pete Blaber that wrote it. Um, fantastic book, fantastic book. I'm a huge reader, um, so I'll probably throw a lot of that stuff out. <clears throat> um, read that book, and I was like, wow, like this is this resonates. Like the mission, the men, and me. Like this is the hierarchy of of how things need to be taken care of. Fast forward to me getting promoted, becoming a company officer. Um, that matrix has shifted a little bit, and. It's, it's, I, I never thought it would. And it was very interesting to kind of, to break this down, but it's the men, the mission and me. And it has to be at this point, because if you don't take care of the men, they can't take care of the mission. If you're not the one that's on the front line doing the mission anymore, then how do you expect to be successful by just focusing solely on that? Like you have to take care of those that are taking care of of, mm -hmm. of them, the people out on the street, the ones that call well, for our services. Well, that also ties you as a company officer, that ties you into doc in the in the army as hey, that's your weapon to Absolutely. get the mission done. Nope. That's your tool as a fire officer to get the mission done. Your priority yep. is the men. You if know, I'm on I never the nozzle today. Yep. If, if I'm on the nozzle. The mission is me getting that that nozzle in the water on the seat of the fire. Yep. And that takes care of the men, and that takes care of me. Yep. And my job care, now is supporting is you in that job. Men. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Making absolutely. you the best suited to to put that line in service and get it in place. But yep. it's funny, I I never made that connection until you just said that about the about my role as a medic being so similar. The the on the schoolhouse door down at medic school was uh, sustain the fighting force. Okay. And that yeah. is a huge um, parallel to what, what I'm doing now. And it really is sustaining the fighting force. Like 
Yeah. I'm there for you. And I tell the guys all the time, if I give them a task <clears throat> or they get assigned something um, as like their area of responsibility, I'm your logistics guy. Like I am just here to give you the tools to set you up for success. And if you as a company officer are not doing that, then you are doing the mission, the men and me a disservice because mm-hmm. you're not setting those people up for, um, for success. You're putting yourself at a disadvantage. You're putting the people out on the street is at a disadvantage. You know, I, I break balls about checking your seats early and, uh, before the start of shift, because I feel so passionately at that you, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to the guy next to you and the people out on the street that as soon as the bells hit, they don't give a shit what shift is on. Mm-hmm. They don't care who it is that's coming out there. You know, the quote about, I expect rocket science brain surgeons to be out there um, and, you know, like triathlete type individuals. The reality of the fire service is it's not like that in most scenarios. So we need to get a, we need to put ourselves in a position to be as close to that expectation as possible. You know, they're, they're taxpayers, they're visitors, their loved ones, their families, like whatever you want to classify them as, you owe them that 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 right 100% you swore 100%. To this for a reason you know you, you know that i feel that way yeah i, I mean, mean not I, only not only do they not care who shows up they have no choice at who who shows up that's also true when so. you dial 911 you have no choice who's coming yep you know and you you look back at the war years the ghetto you you know i'm sure you've read report from engine company 82 they used to pull the pull box for everything. Yep. They used to come That's to the firehouse tough. for everything because they knew they pulled that handle. Problem two solvers. Or less, the fire department was going to show up. That's they right, didn't know right. when the cop was going to show up. They didn't know if an ambulance was going to show up or when it was going to show up. Those firemen, man, they, they're always they there. They knew I pull this handle, fire department's going to show up. Somebody's going to help. Uh, Rob Gancar said, Jim, drink some water. And put in the speak <laughs> at FDIC, you should be here. And Maybe I got to agree. Right well, let's talk about that. You've written, uh, you've written for Firehouse. Mm-hmm. Submit, start submitting for uh, fire engineering. I hear that's what they like. Yeah, maybe we'll see. Now, what uh, mission first training? Let's talk about yep. that. Yes, um, mission first. That was. Uh, Something I started not too long ago. I've uh, I have a passion for building construction. Um, I have a passion for training. Um, so it's kind of a, a marriage between those two mindsets of <clears throat> taking advantage of uh, buildings slated for demolition or major renovation. Um, a lot of times I'll drive around different municipalities, see a building getting torn down. I'm like, damn, there goes a missed opportunity to get in there and and force a real door, preach a real wall, flow water, and see how the building's going to react. Cut holes in roofs, VES into an actual window, like, you know. And I, I explain to people, I'm like, wouldn't it be awesome to play on the championship field before the game actually started? Like, it's, what a cool experience that would be to kind of get the lay of the land. And, yeah. uh, and just, you know you can only stretch in a parking lot so many times before you're like, man, I hope uh, every fire that we, sh- we go to is just in a parking, lot. We'll, parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> getting to the, the fire Academy to burn is, is tough for a lot of departments because staffing, you know, availability, you know, personnel, like there's a lot of factors that come into that, but buildings are always going to be there. There are always going to be new ones built, and there's always going to be old ones getting torn down. So the ability for us to um, to get into them and play on that championship field under manageable conditions. You're in a live building, um, but it's under manageable conditions. And you know, unfortunately, it's not an NFPA uh, 1403 state, so we can't. We can do everything but light the building on fire. Um, <laughs> so USAR training. I've gotten contacted by. Um, some of our law, law enforcement partners and some other agencies that want to do um, different tactics. They want to do active shooter drills in these buildings. 
um, breaking, breaching, all yeah. kinds of stuff, things that they also recognize a need for. Now, do you have buildings? I do. Or yeah, do we. Have... Um, there's there's a couple in the pipeline right now. There's some pretty large, like type two office buildings that are getting uh, slated for demolition. Okay. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to uh, to tear ass into those. Um, you know, single family homes, a couple of them that I've I've heard all over the place. I've made some good connections with demolition contractors and um, realtors, uh, code officials, you know, other fire departments, training officers, training companies, just kind of built the whole premise of Mission First is building these relationships and having this to the point where I am there to help be a resource for these agencies to um, take advantage of these buildings that are going to get torn down. So I uh, handle all the back end stuff. I handle the contacts. I handle the training plans, um, okay. 1403 compliance, the checklists, um, all that stuff, indemnification agreements, like everything is there to make sure that, you know, on short notice, which, you know, time is money. The demolition contractor gets his permit on Friday. That building's coming down on Monday. So yeah. um, being able to, to quickly react and, and jump on these things for folks is, is huge because I don't want people, I don't want people to miss the opportunity to train. In Absolutely. Area. Cause I know I hate missing the opportunity to train. Yeah. So, uh, so far, so good. Yeah, definitely. Um, now is that something you, you plan on eventually opening up to, Hey, I have this building in two weeks. I'm going to be running a course. Here's a waiver for your chief to sign. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the way it works is <clears throat> I source the building or it's sourced for me. Um, you know, if a department hears about it first, they can reach out and say, hey, can you come help us out? Absolutely. Okay. Um, but if I sort, if I source the building, my first phone call is to that, that local chief. And I'll say, chief, got this opportunity for you. I could do a couple things for you. I can give you this guy's phone number. You can talk directly to the demo contractor, use your own equipment, your own people, your own instructors. I walk, I wash my hands and I walk away because I'm just there to build that relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But more often than not with the, the fragile nature of the timeline and the, um, the willingness to jump on those things, I offer them other options too, where, Hey, I can kind of, train your people you can use your instructors but i can give you the training plans it's kind of very a la carte uh how they can go about doing that where i can offer them the ability to have training plans that are canned with jpr checklists the whole nine yards um say hey we've had some struggles with forcible entry recently we'd like to some training plans on that cool I'll send you a google google drive link it's got all of the state fire one fire two and all the officer uh, JPRs as well with your okay. specific ones that you want um, <clears throat> and kind of take that. And then one of the main, you know, one of the big events, um, the option four is I can, we'll have an event. We'll host an event at this, this site. Um, you know, say Nick owns a, this type two warehouse that we're tearing down. Um, Nick's fire department is hosting training day 2024 it's open enrollment anybody can come by you sign the waiver there's a nominal fee 20 bucks something like that 25 enough to cover um like a hoagie tray for lunch some water and gatorade um covers the cost of the instructors um we'll come out there with the proper staffing you know instructor student ratios and we'll 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 rock out all day we'll do an eight hour day of just all different hands-on stations all over the place on this building <clears throat> then whatever the proceeds are at the end of the day, once I take care of the instructors and we cover the cost of the meals and everything, um, the balance of the funds raised that day go back to the fire department as a donation. So there's That's opportunities awesome. there for everybody. Um, you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. That's you phenomenal. Would, the department would be getting paid essentially uh, to go. A fundraiser. Training. Yeah, to go do training in their own buildings in their first do. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's good stuff. And uh, I, I imagine it's going to get pretty busy this summer. I have a lot of good things in the pipeline. 
Um, I've hooked up with a lot of really awesome instructors. Um, so I'm very excited to, to kind of feature some of those folks. And I'm, again, just going to be the logistics guy. Like, I'll be in the background, let these guys do their thing. That's why they are who they are and, you know, rock and roll, baby. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's phenomenal. I love that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I see a lot of strip malls lately that are, like, half the strip malls empty. I know. And I'm like, Jesus, that would be phenomenal. So, Just you know, it's funny. Really, like, all you got to do is... Like, not even flow real water. Like, I've seen where you can cap the end of the hose on the, the pump side, fill it with air, with an air chalk. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and You do that. But let, you're not like, even, if, yeah. if the buildings are slated for demolition, usually the, the contractor's like, bro, this thing's coming to the ground on Monday. Do whatever you want to yeah. it. So we just had a um, a friendly's restaurant that was getting, it was a type five hybrid building. Back end was type two and the main structure was type five with a pitch roof in the front, a flat roof in the back, um, did all kinds of operations in there. Dining room, flowed to two and a half in there, um, was able to show the, the young guys that came to the, to the training day, um, you know, how the stream reacts inside of a live building, how yeah. you can overhaul with the two and a half inch tip, or the two and a half, uh, the stack tips can just obliterate the ceiling tiles, get up into that plenum space above, um, and you could start to hydraulically do a lot of that stuff. We were, you know, the showing the air entrainment through the, the storefront doors, um, showing the water mapping, all of this fun, uh, the UL studies and everything like that, being able to put the rubber to the road and, uh, and really showing them like, this is where, this is what this looks like. And the building's not on fire. Yeah. So, it's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. It was awesome. Absolutely. A really good time. So. All right, so uh, so let's uh, if you have nothing else, let's get into the jersey questions. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Is it pork roll or Taylor ham? Pork roll, baby. I don't know, understand right. where this Taylor ham turn came from, but yeah, it's, I don't know. Some guy John <laughs> Taylor. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, best pizza. So I was thinking about this one. This uh, it depends. Like it absolutely depends on what kind of pizza you're looking for. Um, there's a local spot in Maple Shade called the Sub Shop. Uh, best overall pizza. I love their pizza. We ate it as a kid growing up. Um, still do to this day. Uh, you got to go Santucci's for the square pies. Um, you know, if you're getting Sicilians, I mean, it depends on. There's a lot of fancy stuff out there. All the local spots in Marlton make a good pie. Uh, there's a place on uh, Maple Avenue called Pepino's. It's up uh, by Zed's. I don't know if you know where that is there. But um, mm. they make a fantastic yeah. pie. they got a wood-fired yeah. oven. It's it's good stuff. Go check All that. right. It's right around yeah. the corner from the firehouse, unfortunately. Check that out. But... <laughs> <laughs> Does Central Jersey really exist? Uh... <laughs> You're like our we... first South Jersey guy, so. Really? Yeah. This is what I mean, you Aaron it Heller, but Aaron Heller's. The Hamilton Township, that's Central Jersey. It's what? It's what part of Jersey was it? Central, Central Jersey. Oh, so you said so the that's the my personal opinion. Um that Central your, Jersey exists. Your, I believe that. <clears throat> First, I I don't know. I, I'm asking you your opinion. My answer is no. Central Jersey does not exist. But hold on a second. Neither does North Jersey and neither does South Jersey. We are the Garden State and we are here to F s up there you go <laughs> you can say but, i know but i oh know, the kids, kids are, are in the other room watching but, gotcha <laughs> i gotcha i gotcha yeah. i agree whether you um, uh, it just depends on how strong your accent is that, <laughs> that's the meter <laughs> somebody else said it's it's your it's a combination of your it's a it's averaging out your area code and the sports teams you root for that is very true. That is very true. Go Flyers, baby. I, you know, listen, they may be done, but, you know, we had a good run. All right. So South Jersey, do you go to the beach or you go down the shore? Uh, it depends on who I'm talking to, but we go to the beach. We go to the All beach. Right. What beach of preference? Uh, we love Ocean City. Ocean City has right. been 
for a long time and it's beautiful there and if the if the great garden state didn't tax our pension so much i'd love to retire down there but we'll see what the next 19 years bring um but yeah ocean city is uh is a good time beautiful love it down there all right proudest achievement or accomplishment on the job Ooh, on the job um I'd say it's it's probably a combination of things. Proudest achievement was on the job. It was probably uh, getting promoted. Um, and I say that not to pat myself on the back, but to say that I was able to put myself in a position where I could do more good, if that makes sense. I could put myself in a position to rearrange that hierarchy and put those men and women first um to be able to do the job you know coming up in the uh, in the fire service we've had plenty examples of what not to do um and that's what i've kind of started to develop my playbook on as far as different situations and things like that um but it was it was that opportunity that really helped uh get me where i am today as far as you know my mindset mentality of uh, you got to take care to, to the men. You got to take care of them or else what are you even there for? Like you, uh, I don't sign the paychecks. So like I got to do, <laughs> I got to do something to, to make sure that I'm taking care of somebody. But you know, it's a, it's a family mentality, which I love in the sense that, you know, the wives and the kids and um, spouses and significant others, like they'll come by the firehouse and they'll hang out with us. They'll break bread with us. If, we're working on a holiday. They come by and, uh, you know, the kids are running around the Bay floor and, and having that stuff. And we're, we're giving them the opportunities that we had as children to kind of be exposed to this, this great service of ours. And yeah. I don't think I'd be able to do that if it wasn't for, for getting made. Um, that kind of was the, the genesis of the article too. the, the firehouse article was because I was put in that position um, to lead. I was exposed to this this uh, beautiful scenario where these guys went above and beyond the call of duty. Um, and if you're having trouble sleeping, check it out. It's called Unreasonable Hospitality in the Fire Service. It's on firehouse.com. Um, I think it's a, a great article. Don't listen to him. <laughs> it's, it's more than just a sleeping material. So okay, Good. Thank you very much. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get asked by Rowan University and um, Gloucester County EMS to present at their educational symposium, put a little um, presentation about the article together. And we had a fantastic conversation about um, what we talked about tonight, taking care of people, putting people in a position and fostering that environment to want to do better and to, um, to live that mantra. And it's amazing the effect that being good to people has and how treating one another like humans, speaking to them with respect and just really just taking that extra step. It's not hard to be good to somebody. It really isn't. And no, it's free too. The dividends it pays are, are immeasurable because watching the guys – take care of the public and you get that little dopamine hit. It's like, Oh yeah, that was awesome. Like I, I want to do that again. And then watching them just do that out on the scene and like, like, Hey, like these folks live right down the road and they can't get to their house because of this accident. Um, ambulances parked downstream. Do you mind if we, we don't have any patients? Do you mind if we just drive them to their house? Absolutely. Like that's amazing. That's it right there. That's living the unreasonable hospitality mantra. And and just taking care of people. And it's amazing how it transcends the fire ground because now they're doing it back in the firehouse. It's like, oh, you know, like Nick's birthday's coming up. Like, um, you know, we, he really loves uh, penne vodka for dinner. So we're going to make him his favorite dinner. We're going to get him a cake. We're going to take care of him. Um, you know, we're going to uh, duct tape him to his bed and, and beat the crap out of him. But uh, that, that doesn't happen. It's saran wrap. But anyway. Allegedly. Um, Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it's like doing those things, the folding each other's laundry, like going the little things. 
all over the place to just watching them just take care of each other. And it just, again, that's really what galvanizes a crew and makes them want to want to do better and be better and makes them better providers on the back end. Again, that's what we're, that's what we're here for. So why would you take full advantage of that stuff? So that was a long winded way of answering your question about what I'm most (laughs) proud of. Um, And it's, it's definitely that. And I'm looking forward to see where the journey takes me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So am I. We'll see. Keep going higher, bro. It might take me to the loony bin first. So who knows? (laughs) Uh, All right. What, uh, what advice do you have for the fire service? Past, present, coming up, future. Uh, for the past guys, uh, because the- this, because as soon as we're done, this is immortalized on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn oh, forever. God. Oh, but- like in the in the words of Squint's Pipe Apollodorus, forever. <laughs> That's right. Um, advice. I'll start with the old guys. Um, in the vein of Salty Sunday, and that same sentiment, uh, don't disappear. Like we we need you. Like is. I had a lot of mentors in the Morristown Fire Department as well, and uh, was I'm fortunate enough to every once in a while catch up with those guys. And <clears throat> unfortunately, more than, more recently than ever, it's been funerals. Um, but that's yeah. But that's the um, striking while the iron's hot because it's right in their in their wheelhouse. That like man, like this is a finite game that we're playing here. There's there's not this ain't going to go on forever. Um, you can't just hang it up. Like we, and if you're physically incapable of doing the job anymore, I understand a hundred percent. These, these volunteers that have 40, 50 years of service. Cool. Like I understand if you can't do the job anymore, but that doesn't mean that you're not still wanted. You're still valued. There's still a place for you in the department. Um, you, we need you to come around. We need you to impart your wisdom. And I don't know if it's just this season of life that I'm in where I'm really like heavy in the reflection um, period, but it's like, you, you got it. These, they're not going to last forever. Like we need these people to come around and impart this wisdom and, and pay it forward to the, these new generations and stuff like that. And I'm, I am so, I'm so done with hearing about, the millennials, the millennials, this, the millennials, that, you know, first of all, fuck off. I'm a millennial technically by the, uh, you know, the the (laughs) time frame there. Um, but you know, people say, Oh, these kids, these days, these kids, these days, they don't know how to, you know, no, no, no. The biggest kicker I get about the, the people who curse the millennials, the loudest screaming about the millennials are the ones that raised them. (laughs) Oh, Yeah, that's true. They're yeah, the, they're the ones it. who parented and raised <clears throat> the millennials. And you're, you're complaining right. about them. So what does that say about you? You're absolutely right. But I'm a the, shitty um, person as a millennial. You're a shitty parent. I don't know. I didn't start the fire. But yeah. anyway, it's like, you know, the guys that complain, these these kids don't know which end of a hammer to swing. And it's like, okay, well, fucking show them. Like, yeah. what, are you, what are you doing? And you have to be the ones... To, to be those the sage advice and you know the wisdom and you know but there's there's a caveat to that too where it's like you can't just be that dinosaur who lays dinosaur eggs and say this is the way we've always done it like, exactly you have wow. to you have to realize that you don't know everything and that all you're offering is perspective you're not offering mm-hmm. gospel you're offering perspective and I need you to to take that into consideration and but, see, see that's that's one thing i always tell the old because I, I consider guys our age the middle of the road we're not i old, hope so we're not the old salty you know. we're not the young kids anymore we're we're that that strength that foundation the core of the job right now yeah. and we you know we're the ones that are really charged especially you as the author as an officer the other one that's really charged with making that homogenous, which sounds like you really are doing with your guys and, and your 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 crew that's you know following you. You know, we're making we're charged with making that homogenous zone 
where it's these guys are com- these young people are comfortable sitting at the table with these old birds and the old birds don't just get up when they sit down because you know what like you said with, with along the lines with the salty sundays once that's gone that's gone forever yeah and yeah. we're never going to get that back so the young guys i always like to tell learn to listen but you know what learn to not listen to learn respond. to focus on right. the the information the information in the story because you right. know what we all know those guys that oh back oh, oh, there's one time we were and you're thinking to yourself you're like wait a second i was at that fire i don't remember him even it being didn't go there. like that yeah. Yeah. doing all that stuff but you know what there's a lesson in that story take the me take the i take the the i you know i was on the roof and i had the nozzle and i pulled the baby out and i pulled the nuns out and yeah just take don't focus on this guy was the only one at this fire but focus on the story inside that sure. focus on the knowledge that can be pulled out of that yep. and then from the older you know for the older side i always like to say yeah they're always asking why this young generation but our whole lives or their whole lives They've been told, don't just go blindly into a dark room because somebody told you to. Don't yep. you know? Yeah, somebody down a dark alley, you hear a voice saying, "Help me, help me." Don't just run down a dark ha- because somebody's yelling, "Help me!" Right. Find out why you're doing something. So now they're sitting in the firehouse and they're and you're telling them about this or that or how to set up a, a tripod or a, a rigging or something like, and they're saying why. Maybe they're not saying. Why, Jim? Why, Jim? Yeah. They're asking why. Because they want to understand. They want to know why. They want to understand why they're doing it. Yep. Because that's how they've always been taught. So, yeah. I mean, maybe have a little that... bit of, Maybe have a little bit of humility to realize that you as the instructor, maybe you're not meeting their needs as a student. And maybe that's why they're asking why. Because they just yeah. aren't understanding, you know, and... We had these drill sergeant like guys growing up. They're like, you know, the line yeah. goes through this door for this reason and that at this pressure, you know, mm-hmm. like just put it at 185 and then we'll back it off if we need to. I'm like, well, that's yeah. the wrong answer because what if I'm stretching differently? What if I got a different tip on there? Like, no, nah, just hit that and then we'll we'll adjust it from there. And I'm like, 100%. Well, why? Like, <laughs> it, that that doesn't does not compute. But well. And yeah. then in the same breath, they're telling you, you know, when we were coming up, they're telling you, oh, different hoses, different pump pressure. Well, then how do I just pigeonhole to 50 pounds at the nozzle and 30 pounds per inch uh, per hundred yeah. foot of inch and three quarter? Well, wait a second. You just told me every every type of inch and three quarter is, is different pump pressure. So how do I just right. pigeonhole it in one? Right. But... Right. No, it's it's pretty wild. And like, if we don't have those old guys coming around, then you know, we're a lot of information doomed. Lost. We're doomed to make the same res- mistakes they did if we don't Absolutely. learn. So they got, it. but we need to know that those mistakes were made, and we need yes. to to verbalize mm-hmm. them. You know, hundred percent. But and then that's uh, to the guys in the present. You know, just to keep doing what you're doing, man. Like the in the absence of orders you need some standing guidance. And I tell the guys all the time uh, up at, up at station one, I'm like, make a difference. That's your standing guidance. In the, in the absence of me being there, if you're faced with a decision, it could be the most menial of task or a life or death decision. Your, your lighthouse in this is make a difference. So if you sit there and say, uh, Jim tasked me with, with developing this training, but I also need to go out back in the, in the, flower beds and weed and pull weeds. But Jim's not here to tell me which one to do or which one should I do? Well, which one of those options is going to make a difference in the moment? Is it, yeah. is training up the men and getting everybody better and proficient? The weeds still need to get done. I understand that, but that's not going to make a difference in the moment. They'll be there tomorrow. We'll take care of them tomorrow. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's their kind of, that's been their guidance in, Again, man, I don't know if, if what lottery I hit or what, but 
I've been so blessed with the crews that I've been getting assigned and these guys right now, this current batch, it's a young group. The senior man's got like seven years on the job and there's, wow. there's 10, 10 people assigned to the station with me now, which is the largest platoon I've ever had. And, um, like I said, seniors guy, senior guys got seven years. Everybody's in the gym first thing in the morning. Everybody's doing everything together. They all love training. They all love, you know, the job. They're into it. You know, we're not without our bullshit like everybody is, but, you know, that's how you get through it. You get through it together. Um, so the advice to the, the current generation is, you know, don't go it alone. Um, make a difference and, you know, just – just watch. I dare you. I dare you. Just make a difference and watch watch how different, how impactful your life becomes. Um, and to the future is is pay attention to the – is just reciprocate this cycle, man. Like for, for the guys in the future, just keep those salt dogs in your circle. Um, you know, run with the right people and hopefully the, somebody else will be having this conversation with you Uh couple of years from now and and be preaching the same thing absolutely yeah man. absolutely maybe i'll maybe i'll, I'll have a uh, co-host by then no i don't know <laughs> you better add a 25th hour to the day my friend but <laughs> it, it, it really doesn't take that much time i'm telling you i've talked your ear off now for an hour and 47 minutes so hey and do you have anything else anybody any shout outs you want to make any uh to the Main Street Militia, man, I wouldn't be where I am today without you guys. And I love you all. And, you know, it's that I, I heard something recently on a podcast where this um, female lieutenant from Milwaukee uh, said uh, her her thing is train them and tell you the, tell you train them and tell them you love them. And I was like, wow, like that is huge. And I, I again was reflecting on it for, for a while. And I, I do. And I started doing that. Like we train them like, Hey man, like you guys killed it today. Good job. You know, we, we got some stuff we want to work on. We got some stuff we did really well. This is fantastic. All right, man. And we, like when we're getting ready to break down, I'm like, all right, love you guys. Just throw it in there. So they always know that, you know, Jim's got their back no matter what. And, you know, and they have my back. No, I, I have no doubt that those guys have my back. And, um, I'm very, very happy to, to say that. And I'm very excited about where we're going. The department's in, gone through a major renaissance where most of our, uh, most of our management and our upper, um, our executive staff are nearing the end of their careers. So there's a huge turnover happening in the next three to five years. And uh, I am very excited to see the next generation of leaders coming up in this place. And Heisler uh, for chief. I, I don't know about all that. I think I would miss I would miss the um, the right front seat too much, but <laughs> uh, if the chief could ride the right front seat, then you know maybe we'll talk about it. But till then, chief, you can do whatever you want. You know that's true, but you know <laughs> he's got he's Higher got chief bigger, he's got bigger Higher chief to cry, I think. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but no, I'm I'm excited for it. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm either going to wind up in an institution or you know. <laughs> ah, you and me both, brother. Yeah, driving back and forth to Cape May. I keep driving past Ancora. I'm afraid one of these days they're gonna have a have a net and they're just gonna <laughs> you know, yank me in there. <laughs> Throw away. <laughs> but, All right, man. Well, hey, I will, uh, you. I'll let you go get washed up and uh, yeah, go have some dinner or something. I I will. Um, thank you again for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. You're doing you're doing great stuff, and um, you're you're the one doing great stuff. I'm just advertising guys every week, and uh, and I'm happy to share it with you. Then let's put it that Absolutely. way. Absolutely, awesome, cool beans, right. man. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon, brother. Stay safe. Hang out, and uh, uh, let me say goodbye to everybody, and then I'll talk to you on the off. All right, that's another uh, that wraps up another run, run number eleven with Lieutenant Jim Heisler from Eve Sham Fire to Rescue. Uh, for those of you interested, Eve Sham, as we said, is advertising positions full time, 
career positions as EMT and firefighter EMT. Check them out. Eve Sham Fire Rescue. Have a good night and stay safe. See you next week.